Prop clear. Clear. External power is not required. Seat height adjust. Use the seat adjustment knob here on the left console. Uh, I'm going to bring mine up. Ideally, what you're looking for, there is a green stripe that's on the top of the EADI. As you're sitting in your seat, you want to just have this eyebrow panel about cut halfway through this green stripe. That's a, a rough technique for setting your seat height in the appropriate correction. So you also have a four aft lever. Uh, the lever is located on the left hand side. The alignment stripes are located on the right hand side of your seat. So if you need to move forward or back on the seat, uh, you just lift up on the lever and then use your feet to uh, bring yourself forward and aft as necessary. Rudder pedals adjust. So we'll pull out on our rudder pedal uh, handle, push the pedals away from you if you need more leg room or uh, just release your heels and let the pedals slide towards you if you need uh, a little bit less uh, rudder pedal extension. Ideally, you want them in, the, in an appropriate position where your legs are not fully extended, especially when you, get, when you put in uh, full rudder displacement. You also want to check the top of your rudders and make sure that you're able to brake appropriately on the tow brakes. Flight control is clear? Flight control is clear. So in order to do this uh, flight control check, uh, you want to start as a technique with your elevator, go full up, full down, okay? And if we were in an actual T6, we would be looking at the uh, tail section of the aircraft to see that uh, displacement. Go uh, left aileron, right aileron, and then again, now with the rudder, left rudder, right rudder, looking uh, to verify free and correct movement and that there's no binding or jamming in the control surfaces. My flight controls check. My flight controls check. Uh, so now we're going to check our lamps test. Here's the lamp button on the aft portion of the left front console. You're going to take your finger, press and hold the lamp switch. As a technique, you can work from left to right in the cockpit. So we'll start down at the landing gear. We have a red gear light and a handle, three red lights, three green lights, working our way to the top eyebrow panel. We have our master warning, master caution that are illuminated and flashing. We have our fire lights. And then last, on the right side of the cockpit, we have our central warning system, our CWS panel. All of our lights are uh, indicating appropriately. So we can release that switch. My lamps check. My lamps check. Audio overspeed. So we'll check the overspeed. We'll press and hold that in your headset. You'll hear the overspeed tone. Next, you'll check the landing gear and repeat that same process, looking for a couple of tones in your headset to make sure that you have the correct sound. The next test would be of the AOA stall warning system. So first we'll start with the low setting. Uh, initially, before we do any testing, we're at zero AOA on our AOA gauge and then our AOA indexer is showing a red chevron. So we'll press and hold the low AOA portion of the AOA test switch looking for our AOA gauge needle to increase to approximately 10 and a half units, which is in the green band. And then we're also looking for an amber donut. So we have the correct indications. Now we're going to transition and press and hold the AOA high indication. We have a green chevron and our AOA indexer increases to approximately 18 AOA. At between 15 and the 15 and a half AOA, you'll hear the stall warning horn in your headset. Next check will be the fire warning system. So the first part of this is to check fire one, which is on the aft portion of the left front console. You'll take your hand, press and hold the switch up in the fire one position. You'll get a master warning as well as two upper bulbs on the uh, fire display on your, on your eyebrow panel. Uh, and that is a call out, fire one. Fire one. That checks the one portion of the fire loop. Then you'll press and hold the fire two on the same uh, portion of the left front console and you'll repeat that same process. Red master warning, two bulbs in the lower portion of the fire display. Fire two. Fire two. Next we'll verify flaps are up. As a technique I'll take my hand and physically verify that the flap lever is in the up position as well as verify that my flap gauge is showing up. Exterior lights are off so here are all my exterior lights. I have four switches. I make sure physically take my hand and verify I have four switches in the off position. Then I'll verify the trim disconnect switch is in the norm position. This one is a call out. Trim disconnect switch norm.
Trim disconnect switch norm. Next, we'll verify the trim aid switch is off. Next, we'll check that our trim is uh, all working correctly. As a technique, I'll start with the elevator. So our elevator trim and aileron trim are located on the top part of our control stick. I'll run the trim uh, nose high enough in order to get a, make sure that it's working and that the indicator gauge is uh, cor correctly displaying what I'm doing. Then I'll return my elevator trim to the takeoff or the green band. Check aileron trim. The switch for the rudder trim is located on the PCL. You'll control it with your left hand and fingers. We want to verify that the rudder trim is set outside of the green band prior to engine start. Once we have the engine started and uh, we get further along in our checklist, we'll turn the trim aid switch on. And when we do that, our rudder trim will go to the green band. That is a check later on. But for the moment, this is the correct setup for the cockpit all flights checklist. My trim checks. My trim checks. Next, I'll check and verify that the emergency landing gear handle is stowed. So just simply push the handle in and make sure it's in the correct position and not extended. Next, we'll check our clock and set it. So as a technique, I like to bring it over to the timer mode. You'll press the select button until it reads four zeros. And then you can start the, start the timer and then reset it. Your clock is now set. Next step is to reset your accelerometer. You want to read that you're reading approx. You want to see that you're reading approximately one G, and you reset it by pushing the push to set button. Next, we'll check the audio panel. We want to make sure uh, that all of our indication, uh, all of our switches are in the correct position. Uh, here in RIQ, the biggest things that you'll be concerned with are the UHF communications knob, the VHF communications knob and the nav communications knob. You want to make sure that they are pulled out, at least your UHF and VHF communications, and then uh, they are, they are uh, able to be tuned in terms of your volume. Uh, ideally, as a technique, if you set a mid-range where this white band is in the 12 o'clock position, uh, that is a good starting point in terms of volume when you're setting up your, your audio panel. Uh, your navigation communications, uh, these are for your navigation uh, radios, so for your VORs, your ILSs that you will see later on in the program. Um, you would pull this knob out, and again, uh, turning it left or right controls the volume, and uh, this allows you to hear the uh, Morse code identifiers that are a part of those uh, navigation, navigational aids and uh, that they are working correctly. We'll check the standby flight instruments. They compose of the standby airspeed indicator, standby attitude indicator, standby altimeter, and your turn and slip indicator. So we're basically looking to make sure that we re we're reading approximately uh, zero knots since we're on the ground and not moving, that our uh, standby attitude indicator is approximately showing level or slightly nose high based on the ramp, the parking area that you're, that you're in, uh, slightly nose high or slightly nose low or a level is all appropriate uh, based on where you're at. Uh, we want to make sure that, again, there's no flags in any of our instrumentation, uh, no off flags, and then there would also be a flag here on your turn and slip indicator, but we're not showing that. It would be red in this little box, so we're good there. Um, we don't have a current altimeter setting, but when we do, we'll set the, uh, we'll set the altimeter setting with this knob. Moving up to our standby magnetic compass, we want to check and verify uh, that it is showing an approximate uh, heading that is appropriate for what, air, what direction our aircraft is facing. Currently is showing about uh, 235. Next, we're moving to the AHARS mode control switch, which is in the uh, right lower portion of the front instrument panel. You want to verify that this lever is in the slaved or SLVD position. Prior to releasing and resetting the parking brake, uh, according to the aircraft tech order, you have to pump up the brakes in order to ensure there is enough pressure to hold you. So in order to do this, move your toes up to the top part of the rudder pedals. And there's no uh, number of times that is required. Uh, I would say as a technique, put about three to five pumps in the brakes before resetting the parking brakes. So one, two, three. Take your right hand, slightly pull out, turn the handle, counterclockwise,
push it in, then uh, reset by pulling out, turning the handle clockwise until it stops, and then releasing the brakes. Generator switch off. Generator switch off. Take your hand and verify it's in the off position. Fuel balance switch should be in auto. Manual fuel balance should be off. Uh, you might not be able to tell in the video, but this is actually a uh, left-right position switch. So off is the middle position. Avionics master switch off. Bus tie switch, norm. To check our probe's NII uh, system, uh, this is a, kind of like a two-part check. So you will first take your finger, bring the switch to the on position. You'll get the green NII light. And more importantly, you will also get an electrical draw on your engine system display in the amps portion. So you see right now, with the probe's NII switch on, we're showing negative 48 amps. So now when I turn the switch back off, our amp draw goes down to negative 40 and the anti-ice light extinguishes. Therefore, the system is operating correctly. And we'll, we'll do the same exact thing with our boost pump switch. We'll bring the boost pump with your finger to the on position. You will see the boost pump light on your CWS panel. You will also see an electrical draw on the engine system display in the, amps seg in the amps portion. So it's showing negative 52 amps. You may also hear a, like a cycling uh, mechanical sound in your headset, and that is just the boost pump operating. When you turn the boost pump switch off, our electrical draw will go down and our boost pump light will go off. So our amps went down back to negative 40, our boost pump switch extinguished and we will no longer be hearing the boost pump in our headset. PMU switch norm, lever locked. Cockpit all flights checklist complete. High IOET starts above 80 degrees Celsius are not normally required in our IQ. So we'll proceed to the engine start auto checklist. The first step of the engine start auto checklist is step two, navigation and anti-collision lights as required. So here in RIQ, we will take our navigation and anti-collision lights located in the forward portion of the left front console and switch them on. Next, we'll check that the PMU fail and PMU status enunciators are extinguished. We look for that on our CWS panel. For an engine start, this is an appropriate normal indication. We have generator, OBOX fail, oil pressure, and fuel pressure, all in red as well as a green tad off. PCL, advanced start ready, start ready light illuminated. In order to do this, take your left hand and slowly advance the PCL to the start ready position. As a technique, adjusting your throttle friction on your friction control just underneath the PCL. If you increase your friction, this might help you and the fine uh, motor control it takes in order to set start ready on the T6 PCL. So I've adjusted my friction control. I'm going to take my fingers like this and slowly advance the PCL until I reach the start ready position. And I look for the start ready light on our CWS panel at the very bottom right. If you advance the PCL too far out of the start ready position, bring the PCL back to the stop to cut off and then restart this process. Prop clear, crew chief, fire bottle, no servicing, start ready light on, cranking. So we've completed our call out, our prop area is clear, we're ready to start the engine. In order to do that, take your right hand to the starter switch and you'll lift up on the lever, flip it forward to auto reset and then release it and it will spring back to the vertical neutral position. Realize that this uh, sequence will start happening fast so you will get a boost pump light and then your first indication, your, your eye should go to first, is to your uh, engine system display because you'll see a large uh, volt 
draw and an amperage draw. And then also your hydraulic system, your hydraulic pressure will come up immediately. And then next you'll go to your alternate engine data display where you should see fuel flow uh, immediately next to your primary engine data display where you'll see ITT within 10 seconds. Um, so let's start with that. We'll go ahead and crank the switch and then I'll talk you through the rest of it. Here we go. Lifting up on the switch, auto reset, release. So we see our big uh, amperage draw, hydraulics coming up immediately, fuel flow, we got light off, ITT within 10 seconds. N1 is climbing. Oil pressure is climbing in the green. We still have fuel flow, ITT, uh, and this is within limits. 750 was our highest. N1 is still climbing. Coming back down, our amperage draw is more normal. Oil pressure is in the green. Oil temperature is in the green. Hydraulic pressure is in the green. Fuel flow is good. Coming back up, ITT is stable. We're within 60 to 61%. So now we can go ahead and bring our PCL switch, or bring our PCL uh, past two clicks in order to uh, finish up the start sequence. Uh, additionally of note, our OBOGs fail, red oil pressure and red fuel pressure lights have all extinguished because now the those pumps and the accessory gear box are turning appropriately. So we'll take our left hand, we'll place the PCL past two clicks, bring the PCL back to the idle position. When we do that, we're still showing 60 to 61 N1, 60 to 61 percent N1. Our torque should be roughly under 10 percent, and we should show NP between 46 and 50 percent. Uh, scanning the rest of our systems, we're showing 23 and a half volts and discharging 40 amps, which is appropriate. We're on battery power, and our oil temperature, oil pressure, hydraulic uh, uh, pressures, and temperatures are all in the green. We have good fuel flow. Come back up. Our ITT is stable, so this is a good engine start. Uh, as a technique, uh, hopefully you saw that my eyes and, and my cross check was moving uh, in a triangle fashion. I call this as a technique, the triangle check, as a way to keep your eyes moving on what's important during the engine start sequence. External power, disconnect if used. Here in RIQ, you'll not normally use external power, so that is not applicable in this case. Engine start auto checklist complete. Interior lights set. So in order to do this, uh, a normal T6 interior lighting is located on the front left portion of the left front console. However, these lights here in RIQ and RIQ sims uh, do not work. Uh, our only source of interior lighting in RIQ sims is this flexible snake light. So in order to turn it on and off, most simply, uh, just it's a tap light. So you tap back here where it connects to the console to turn it on and off and then set it to the uh, angle and intensity that you desire. Taxi checklist. Gen switch on, annunciator extinguished. So a generator switch is up on the right, uh, forward right portion of the, right, uh, of the forward front console. So you'll take your finger, you'll press the gen switch to the on position. When you do that, the red generator light will extinguish and your uh, volts will increase to between 28.0 and 28 and one half volts. So gen switch goes to the on position, light extinguishes, and our volts are showing correctly. Avionics master switch on. Uh, you need to wait 10 seconds between turning the generator switch on and then turning on the avionics master switch on. So you can either time it or count to 10. It's been 10 seconds. So in order to do this, you'll have to use your fingers, lift up on the avionics master switch and bring it forward. When you turn the avionics master switch on, uh, many of your other cockpit instrumentation will turn on. Next step is to check the aircraft speed brakes. This is a call out item. In order to check the aircraft speed brakes, we'll first call out speed brake clear. Clear. You'll move the speed brake with your left thumb by bringing this grayish white knob aft towards you. 
Speed brake, lights on. Speed brake, lights on. In order to uh, then uh, make the speed brake go away, we'll move our flaps. Flaps clear. Clear. So now you'll take your finger, go to the flap lever located next to the PCL, and you'll bring your flaps down to the landing position. So you move the flap lever down until it hits a stop. Our speed brake light extinguishes. Our flaps are showing landing. Flaps landing, lights out. Flaps landing, lights out. We'll move our flap lever to takeoff, which is a middle neutral position on the flap lever. Flaps take off. We will go back to the speed brake switch, pull it back towards us again, and verify that the speed brake light does not come on. Flaps take off, speed brake will not extend. Flaps take off, speed brake will not extend. Let me make sure I got it. I think that was all the. All right. Speed brake clear, all your clear. Oh God. The next item is to turn the trim aid switch on. When you turn the trim aid switch on, the biggest thing we want to look for is for our rudder trim to move into the green takeoff band. Our tad off light on our CWS panel extinguishes. So that was a good check. When the GPS comes up, it will likely look like this with the flight plan zero page and the nav five page loaded. So let's start by loading a flight plan. Currently, we're showing flight plan zero, which is our active flight plan. This is what the aircraft will be drawing its GPS information from and then displaying onto your instrumentation. If you want a different flight plan, so we have 25 different flight plans here in the T6 in RIQ. So if you want something different, use your fingers on the left inner knob, sequence them right or left as necessary to find the flight plan that you want. So let's say we want to set flight plan one. So we started at flight plan zero, use the right inner knob to go to flight plan one, hit the cursor button, it will highlight the word use with a question mark. Then once this, I verify the flight plan I want, I'll hit the enter button. So now I've verified that I have flight plan one, the flight plan I want loaded. Next, I want to check my RAIM. So to move to a separate subpage of the GPS unit, you're going to use uh, the left outer or the like the left bigger knob. You're going to rotate it and sequence until you see the status to page. On this page, we're going to check RAIM and FDE are both showing yes. If either one of those is showing no, uh, we would not be able to take this aircraft. Once we verify that RAIM and FDE are checking correctly, use the left outer knob to sequence back to what's called the Super Nav 5 page. If you want to scale out the distance on the Super Nav 5 page, use the left cursor that selects your distance. Use the right inner knob to increase or, de or decrease the uh, scaling to something that is useful to you. When you're done, hit the cursor button again to deselect and you're ready to go. Flight instruments check. Flight instruments check. So for our flight instruments check, we want to verify our pitch, roll, heading, and vertical speed indications and verify that we have no flags. So. Looking at our instrumentation, we see uh, no big red X's or anything that would suggest to us uh, that anything is abnormal. Uh, we're showing approximately a 235 heading, which uh, checks with what we showed earlier on our standby magnetic compass. Our uh, attitude information, or EADI, is showing just slightly above uh, wings, uh, just slightly above the horizon which uh, also jives with what we see in our standby attitude indicator. Uh, our airspeed is showing zero. Our vertical speed is showing zero. And uh, that 
basically rounds out most of your flight instruments check uh, and we'll also to clean up the final item uh, double check our primary turn and slip into slip slip indicator information um, so everything is neutral on both our primary and our standby turn and slip indicators so uh, we have good flight instruments after turning the avionics master switch on in RIQ, your standard setup for the RMU will look very similar to this. You'll have the UHF, VHF, and your navigate your your navi portion of your RMU all in the memory mode. So you know it's in the memory mode when it shows M with a number next to it. So this is memory frequency one, which is hangover ground. Uh, and for the VOR, memory frequency one corresponds to the Randolph VOR. Uh, some specific things that we need to check and, uh, and adjust in order to call the, the RMU set for flight. We're gonna go to our ATC, our transponder line. We're gonna use a left line, select, left, left line select key to highlight that box. Press the page button that brings us to our flight ID page. In order to properly set our flight ID, hit the left line select key next to T6A1. Use the large RMU knob to scroll left. As you do that, it will uh, erase the numbers that are in there. So for example, my call sign is Reaper50. So according to our SOPs, we'll set the first two letters and then the numbers associated with, associated with my call sign. So we use the inner knob to set R, use the big knob to, uh, to move over to the next space, we set E, and then five zero. So you see I'm just repeating the process of using the large outer and the inner knobs in order to set what I want. In order to get rid of this final one at the end of this number sequence, insert something into this blank part. A zero is fine. Use the outer knob to move over to one. Then use the inner knob, excuse me, use the outer knob to sequence back, move it left to clean up the rest of the sequence and show RE50. Once you, once you have your uh, Flight ID set the way you want it. Press the line select key next to accept and then return. The final step to ensure that your RMU is set up correctly is to uh, select altitude by using the right line select key to show ALT on your, in your transponder window. So for a local RIQ sortie, we should show local channel one for UHF, local channel one for VHF altitude reporting mode for your transponder and local channel one for your navigation. RMU set as required. Prior to checking your altimeters, you'll need to get a current altimeter setting and ATIS information. In order to get the current ATIS information, uh, what most people do as a technique, they'll use your standby UHF radio. In order to turn that on, use this left uh, knob, turn it uh, clockwise right, Channel 18 is our uh, is hangover ATIS out of the uh, and that's from the in-flight guide. If you don't show channel 18, it'll look like this. In order to get channel 18 and know what frequency you're actually using, use this uh, little tiny red channel button located beneath, located beneath the two knobs. So you press that button, you'll see channel 18, and you'll start to receive uh, information, uh, your ATIS information. Notice that when you're using the standby UHF in your RMU under the UHF field, it's going to show remote. Once you're done with the standby UHF, turn the, uh, uh, turn the knob counterclockwise to the off position and the RMU will restore to its normal looking state. For the altimeters check, we want to verify that uh, we have the correct altimeter setting set in the primary and the standby altimeter. So from our ATIS, we know that our altimeter was 2992. So we've set that twice using these knobs. 2992 set twice, showing 740 over 740. 2992 set twice, 740 over 740. Finally, we'll ensure that our CWS panel is clear. 
Panel clear. Panel's clear. Landing and taxi lights as required. The landing and taxi lights are located on the front portion of the left front console. Uh, ideally, uh, and as a technique, uh, you'd want to wait to turn those on until after you received your clearance to taxi from Hangover Ground or whatever ground controlling agency you're working with. So since this is an as required item, I'm going to elect to keep them in the off position. The final item of the before taxi checklist is parking brake release. Uh, similar to as a technique for the uh, landing and taxi lights, uh, a commonly uh, taught method is to keep your parking brake engaged until you receive your taxi clearance. Once you receive your taxi clearance and you're ready to go, in order to release your parking brake, use your feet and your toes to engage the toe brakes on your rudder pedals. And then with your right hand, pull out on the parking brake switch, turn the switch counterclockwise, and guide the uh, lever back into its stowed position before taxi check was complete. Hang around Reaper 50 taxi without. Reaper 50, hangover ground, runway 15 right, taxi via Golf, clear to Randolph Air Force Base via the Falls 6, squawk 4250. Reaper 50, 15 right, 4250. Now that we've received our taxi clearance, we can go ahead and complete our taxi checklist. So first thing is transponder as required. So we're already in altitude, we'll set 4250. The big knobs, uh, the big knob controls your first two numbers, the small knob controls your last two numbers. So our transponder is set. We'll turn our nose wheel steering on by using this red button at the bottom of the control stick. To press that button, you'll see nose wheel steering or NWS light up in green on the left portion of your front cockpit panel. Landing taxi lights as required. Use your left hand to turn the landing and ta uh, taxi and landing lights on. We'll go ahead and release our parking brake. We'll engage the tow brakes, release the parking brake as described earlier, and we'll begin taxiing forward. In order to check the brakes, we need to build up enough momentum in order to, uh, in order to be able to use them. So slight pump of the brakes, my brakes check, check yours. My brakes check. Needles right, balls left, to increasing. While you're taxiing out to the hammerhead, it's time to perform an R news check. First step is to check RAIM, so we'll go to stat page two. RAIM and FTE are showing yes, so they are appropriately set. Nav aids, the EFIS panel is at the bottom of your cockpit. Uh, it has your heading bug, controls the yellow bug looking thing on your EHSI, the course needle. So we'll set 157 for our course, 170 on our heading in accordance with the falls departure. We're also on the VOR mode for the falls departure. We know we're in, uh, showing the Randolph VOR because we're in local channel one on the nav aid portion of our RMU. If we needed to use GPS for some reason, we would hit nav nav twice. This shows us our GPS mode. If I hit nav nav again, it shows me back to my VOR mode. If you hit nav once, it'll show you your distance, your ground speed, and your time. This can be a useful feature in some phases of flight. There's also the arc mode. Shows you a smaller, more zoomed in piece of your EHSI. Uh, these can be valuable, uh, particularly when you're shooting uh, ASR or PS PAR approaches in the instrument phase. In order to get out of the arc mode, hit HSI. Normally, we fly around in the 558th with our white needle in VOR and the magenta needle in GPS. Emergencies are as briefed. Emergencies are covered in the uh, mission briefing guide that you brief at the beginning of each mission. Weather is as briefed unless there are any changes from what you briefed. SID 
or standard instrument departure is what departure you expect to be flying. We'll be flying the fall six, so I would just say that that would be in accordance with the in-flight guide. Taxi checklist complete. The nose wheel steering is exceptionally sensitive. A good technique would be to put your heels on the floor and steer with the balls of your feet. This also allows you to uh, just use your toes to actuate the toe brakes to make sure you're not slamming on the brakes too hard. When you pull into the run-up area, pull into the furthest spot available. So for us, since there's no aircraft, we're going to take the run-up spot right next to the runway hold short line. We'll come to a complete stop, set the parking brake, overspeed governor check, brakes as required, guard the brakes. Guarding. PCL, idle. PMU switch, off. When I do this, we'll get a master caution and master warning that corresponds to our PMU status and PMU fail lights illuminating. Essentially, we've taken the PMU out of the, uh, out of the loop for the system. Um, you'll notice that our N1 is no longer in ground idle. It's at 67%, which is flight idle. There might sometimes be a small ITT bump, and uh, you notice as well that our NP is no longer 46 to 50, which is what it should be on the ground. It's at 51%. All of these indications are normal. That just means that the PMU is no longer providing you the protection. Next step, we'll take the PCL. We'll uh, stabilize it at 100% plus or minus 2 NP. So here's our NP. We'll slowly push the uh, PCL forward. So we have 100% NP, and that is uh, we're... So we have 100% NP, we're at 30 plus or minus 5% on our torque, we're at 32, so that check is complete. To a small bump forward, our ITT remains within its parameters, no more than a 2% shift in our NP, so that's good. We'll then bring our PCL back to idle. So before we re-engage the PMU, we want to verify that our NP, N1, and ITT are all fairly stable. So you see, nothing's really moving or transient. So we'll re-engage the PMU by bringing the switch back to norm. When we do that, our PMU fail and status lights extinguish. There might be a slight ITT decrease. We have show 60 to 61% N1 and 46 to uh, 50 NP. Overspeed governor checklist complete. Before takeoff check. Minimum power at 60 knots, gonna be 100%. A minimum power at 60 knots is computed for each sortie. Normally, this will show up on your mission data card. However, this information is also displayed on the condensed checklist portion of your in-flight guide. So in order to use this chart, you would, you would use the indicated outside air temperature, whatever that was from your forecast, or what's called an ATIS. Go down to the line that matches where you're at. So let's say we had a 45 degree IOAT. We would go over to our pressure altitude, we are roughly at about a thousand feet pressure altitude, so our minimum power uh, would be 92%. Speed brake is verified retracted. Flaps are set to take off. Trim is in the green. Fuel quantity imbalance currently showing about uh, 1050 balanced across both tanks. Engine instruments. We want to do a quick scan of all of our displays, make sure everything is what we expect. Amps, verify 50 amps or less. Currently showing 2 amps. Before takeoff, check was complete. Hangover Tower, Reaper 5-0, holding short. Reaper 5-0, Hangover Tower, 1-5 right, winds 1-4-0-1-0, clear for takeoff. Clear for takeoff, Reaper 5-0. Monot check is... Panel clear. Panel's clear. Rotating switch on. Transponders at altitude. Exterior lights are on. Those with steering, last item. 